千里之行，始于足下。A journey of a thousand miles begins beneath the feet. We now gather in the Tao to travel the journey together. Welcome to Tao Talks with Eric Lin, where we delve deeply into the Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu. It was brought to my attention that a question, that the following question was asked: In some copies of Tao Te Ching annotated and explained, line eight and line nine in this chapter are translated differently. What is the reason? For the difference. So, to、uh, first of all, I am so happy with a question like this. It just it just tells me that people are paying attention and the being very careful,、uh, the being very complete in their study of the Tao. That's a very good thing. That that really makes my day. Now, the reason for the difference, of course, I have for everyone kind of a. Quick answer, a short answer, and a long answer with additional details. So let me start with the short answer. There are a few subtle variations in the classical Chinese text of the Tao Te Ching. I continue to study and research because my purpose is to have as accurate as humanly possible. Uh, a translation as I can offer to the world, to the Western reading public. So sometimes I find it necessary to update my translation for that purpose to keep it accurate. So that's the reason. And now I want to delve into the details and illustrate exactly what the difference is and how it came about,、uh, the corrections thereof, etc. So first, let me show line eight and line nine. As you can see here, movement overcomes cold, stillness overcomes heat, and these come from the original text, Zao Shen Han, Jing Shen Ru. The middle character is the same. It means to win, win over, to be victorious. Over someone or to triumph, translated as overcomes. Then we have、uh, zao, which means to be restless, translated as movement. Han means cold. That's an easy one. And then jing, stillness, tranquility, silence, quietness. And then ru, hot, heat. So. The translation follows pretty much from the original, from the text, but there's a variant version of eight and nine. The format is similar, but the characters are shifted, thus changing the meaning slightly. Here's what the other version looks like: stillness overcomes movement, cold overcomes heat. So look at the text here, Jing Shen Zhao. These characters are well. The middle character is still the same, so it's still overcome. That that part doesn't change. The other characters are shifted around. So Jing, what was the beginning of line nine, becomes the beginning of line eight, and it still means the same thing: stillness, quietness, tranquility, etc. And then Zhao, the restlessness. That is translated as movement, and then line nine is shifted around too. The last part of it is the same, overcoming heat, but the first character Han is cold, and that used to be at the end of line eight. So this is actually the version that I had initially translated for Dao De Jing 
annotated and explained before settling on the version you see today, which is in the top of this slide. Now the question is, wh why the difference? What is the cause of the difference? So the bottom one here, stillness overcomes movement, cold overcomes heat. This is the way that I learned the Delta gene initially. So this is the version that I initially translated. It is how it appeared in the first edition of Delta gene annotated and explained, my translation. Now, I did not initially question the accuracy of the Chinese text. The reason why is because in the, in the version that I translated, both lines seem to follow a poetic pattern to reinforce the idea of cooling down hot temper with stillness. So these two lines still lead naturally to changing. The poetic structure comes from when you look at stillness and cold, jing and han, well, they match. They are the similar. They are all, they are both manifestations of yin, yin and yin and yang. Then movement and heat, they match because they're both manifestations of yang, the yang energy in yin and yang. Now, after the first edition was published, I noticed that there was another version of these two lines, the version that we're using now. When I noticed that there was a, a different version, I investigated and I saw that both versions of these two lines were in widespread use. Some uh, Chinese uh, text and commentary use one, some use the other. And there seemed to be no rhyme or reason when, and I wanted to know what caused the difference between the two. So then what I decided to do was that I investigated uh, older versions of the Tao Te Ching, ancient versions. And I thought that this was a very worthwhile discussion because in the, the, the other variation, the version that I initially did not translate, there was also a poetic structure that is intact, except it isn't the matching, it's the opposites. So movement will be the opposite of stillness. Therefore, cold will be the opposite of heat. That makes a lot of sense. Poetically, it's very sound. So in terms of structure, there's no one version better than the other. So it's down to investigating the ancient versions of the Delta gene. So this, this can lead us to a fascinating discussion on, on the ancient versions. The, the text that you, the graphic that you see this is an actual shot of the very ancient version uh, in the original form back uh, before substantial amounts of ling linguistic evolution has given us the, the form of the, the characters we see today. So what is the very earliest version of the Tao Te Ching? Well, it's the one that was written by Lao Tzu. So we don't have an exact time for when it was written, approximately, we just pin it down to 2,500 years ago. We don't have a copy of that. The copy is lost to history. If it were to surface, it would be a major archeological find. It would be like Raiders of the Lost Ark. So this version we don't have, we can only guess at it. We can only see what it probably contained based on the versions that are almost as old as 2,500 years, but not quite. So then there's one version that was unearthed from Guo Dian. Guo Dian is a tomb, a series of tombs in the ancient times when a notable person, perhaps a noble, perhaps royalty, 
when that person was buried, when that person had died and was buried in a tomb, they weren't mummified like the ancient Egyptian practice, but they would certainly bring with them, they would be buried along with the items that they treasured while alive. And for some, treasured items included their copy of the Tao Te Ching. So this was the exciting part, that when you unearth these tombs and you see these ancient fragments for Guo Dian, for, for the tomb at Guo Dian, the ancient fragments were on bamboo slips. And they dated back 2,300 years ago. There was another version also from a tomb at around that time. And this was Ma Wang Dui. This is the name of another tomb. This was an earlier discovery. The Guodian tomb was discovered in the 1990s, in the early 1990s. Ma Wang Dui was discovered earlier than that. And at the time, it was the earliest version of the Tao Te Ching known to history, known to archaeologists. The version inside the tomb at Ma Wang Dui was written on silk. Many of the characters are incomplete, which makes it resemble someone trying to write down based on memory uh, what the Tao Te Ching contained. And it dates back roughly 2,200 years ago. There was a version after that at around the same time as Ma Wang, Ma Wang Dui, the one that was un unearthed and dated from the tomb. And that's He Shang Gong. This time, it's not so much connected to a tomb as it was connected to a sage by the name of He Shang Gong. This is sort of a sage by the river type of thing. That's the title. That's not a proper name. That's the title of a particular sage who studied and taught the Tao 2,200 years ago. So there's a version associated with that as well. And finally, Wang Bi. Wang Bi is a young scholar who in his early 20s looked at all the versions of the Tao Te Ching prior to his time which is uh, roughly 1775 years ago. He looked at all of those different versions. He combined and unified them into a standard version, which was then in use from that point on. So that is the version, the Wang Bi version of the Tao Te Ching that has the greatest effect on the various dynasties that came and went for the last thousand years. It is the version that I standardized on for my own translation. So here's the interesting thing. For all of these ancient versions, they all contained the version of the passage, line eight and line nine, that you are looking at now, that is currently available now in the current printed version of my translation. That being the case, I realized that this was probably the correct one, even though both variants were in widespread use. The one that I was looking at from ancient times was much more likely to be the one that Lao Tzu intended. There was likely a change within the last 17 centuries that ended up with a slightly distorted version. In all likelihood, it might be due to times of warfare and chaos that made it necessary to transmit the teachings of the Tao Te Ching from one person to another through memorization. That is, after warfare, chaos, and strife, you may be able to settle down somewhere, live a normal life, then you would try to write down what you had committed to memory from before, what you can recall 
of the Tao Te Ching in order to teach it to the next generation. Somewhere along the line, imperfect human memory might have made mistakes. So this is the reason why I think you would agree I had to switch back to the version that was more likely to be the original version. Now, Wang Bi, the last note on this young scholar, Wang Bi, he passed away shortly after he completed his work while still in his 20s. He was quite uh, the prodigy as a scholar. Wang Bi, from 1775 years ago, he most likely had access to even older versions and many more versions of the Tao Te Ching than we have access to, additional versions that are also lost to history. So I trust that he had good reasons in his choice to create the consolidated and standardized version. That's the reason why I standardize on it. So let's go back to that standard version. Movement overcomes cold, stillness overcomes heat. I updated the manuscript. I standardized on the version you see today across my presentations on Sundays, like today, and on the website. Now, I want you to notice that Laozi is really expressing the yin and yang in two levels, where he says movement overcomes cold. Movement is yang, cold is yin. Then stillness overcomes heat. Stillness is yin, heat is yang. And line eight and line nine manifest as yin and yang as well. Line eight moves toward cold, yin. Line nine moves toward heat, yang. Indeed, in the ancient historical commentaries, Sages, scholars have often connected these concepts to seasons. They explain them in terms of seasons. This includes the scholar Wang Bi, who consolidated and unified the variant versions of the Tao Te Ching before him, and also He Shang Gong, the sage who lived by the river. He also commented on the same lines, and he also linked them to the changing of seasons. So let me explain the way they explained it with the following table. There is the character linked to a season. So first, the easiest way is to look at line eight and start from the back. Cold, I think you would, I think it would make sense to you to automatically connect that to winter. So where it says movement overcomes cold, that's talking about how winter is behind us, spring is coming, and therefore all the living things become restless. They begin to move. They begin their activities. So spring comes displacing winter. That's how much sense this makes. And it's a context that I know would escape most people unless they have proper guidance. Then take a look at line nine. And again, it's easier to work from the back. Heat, you would, of course, automatically associate that with summertime. It's a natural correspondence to associate hot, heat, heated hotness with summertime. Stillness overcomes heat. Now you see how the logic, go, logic goes. It is easy to see that when fall comes, when autumn comes, it displaces the heat of the summer. And there you have it. Even the concept of cycles, endlessly repeating cycles, is embedded in the original writing of the Tao Te Ching. There are levels of meaning that I never previously touched on. 
I am so happy we have this opportunity today. Please note that the large print and hardcover editions of Dao De Jing annotated and explained the publisher, uh, the book itself went through a change of publisher. It went from Skylight Paths to a larger publishing company, Turner Publishing. And the new publisher used the original, the initial translation manuscript as the basis for the large print and hardcover editions. So this is something that I'm going to need to work with them on correcting. But in the meantime, I would urge everyone to always look for the real standard in our presentations and also on the web. Our meeting has come to an end, but the journey continues on. Let us travel safely. Until next time, may the Tao fill you with peace and happiness.